Here he that is. Here he is. Now we've got him. Hey, mm -hmm. um, thanks very much for speaking to us here at the sure. in inaugural FAF. Now, um, I just wonder if you could tell me, uh, um, Neil Foley, our director, describes your input into FAF as integral. Uh, how do you see it? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what transpires in Melbourne. We had uh, uh, a lot of conversations, me and Nick, and me and Neil, and uh, we... Uh, I was surprised to see in the catalogs that he had listed the New York Asian Film Festival as a big inspiration for the festival, but hey, we'll take it. Um, the convenient thing is I've seen most of the movies already and you know have an idea of what the presentations are going to be like, so I'm happy to help out. It's it's flattering. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I, I, my by inspiration being me, I'm assuming the inspiration is me and my partners as well in New York, and we just like to show fun films that the audience can really get into and and get agitated over and enjoy and I hope that's what happens in Melbourne. Uh, is, it, is it just me or has Asian cinema suddenly um, raised its excitement level once again? It seems like it has. Um, you know, I mean, I, I sort of got to like Asian cinema at the time that the you know, Jackie Chan was in his prime, and there were all of the cool Hong Kong movies from John Woo and Choi Hark. I mean, they were all in video, basically. That's what I was watching and going in Chinatown and renting. And, you know, there was the aftermath of the Japanese gore wave going on. And it just comes and goes. You know, there was the J-horror wave that came and went, and it kind of died off. And then the Korean action wave, and now it seems to be really happening again. There's a lot of cool movies out there. Um... I think what we're noticing now is mainly that the American distributors are finally taking note of what, um, you know, at least for me, the North American distributors are taking note of what, you know, fans have known all along, is that these movies are cool and more exciting than domestic product, and, you know, the domestic product keeps ripping it off, so there's more and more ways of getting the movies to the audiences now than there ever was before, so you've got companies licensing their films to like Netflix, you know, or or the, uh, like a video on demand service or something directly, where they can just bypassing and the middleman of an American distributor. So you know, for me in the U.S., you've got in New York City, you've got Chinese and and Korean distributors putting their movies on the big screens, specifically for a domestic, you know, for a same language audience, and they don't care if the white people want to see their movies. But for those of us again in the know, we were able to do it. It's almost like the Chinatown theater days again. So yeah, I think it's 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 partially you know a, a bigger wave of stuff, but also we're just able to see more of the stuff that's been out there all along. Can you cite any sort of reasons why production sort of might be ramped up now? And right across Asia, not as you've mentioned, Korea. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, in Japan, I don't think the production even even going back before the the earthquake, I don't think production is has has gotten more frequent. Right. Um, I just think, well, it's certainly in countries outside of the big, the big ones, outside of the traditional powerhouses of Hong Kong, Korea, and Japan, you know, China has certainly come along in the last five or six years mm -hmm. where, you know, you could sort of write off China if you were running a film festival as, well, there's some art films and that's it. Um, now there's all kinds of movies coming out of China from independent cinema to genre films to all kinds of stuff. And then it's hard to classify nowadays what's a Chinese movie because everything seems to be a co-production. That also came about in the last few years where you know you don't get a movie that doesn't have a Korean actor in it or a Japanese actor or some you know configuration to make it basically pre-sold in those countries. And you've got Hong Kong actors bringing mainland Chinese films and vice versa and Taiwan crossing the borders so it's getting harder and harder to pin down the, the movies as one country, so that's that's certainly ramped up. Where you know movies cost more, and you need to get this guaranteed appeal in another country in the Asian region, Pan Asian region. Um, you know, in Korea, sort of was up and down. They seem to be up again and doing bigger productions um, after a few years of a little bit fallow time. So you know, I think it's just always the case that if the audience is there; they make more movies. Um, you know, Japan is on a bit of a downfall now, but mm. it just means that in many cases that the bad stuff gets whittled out. You know, the bad stuff is the stuff that falls through the cracks in a lot of cases. So what's so exciting you really for you? Uh, 
Sorry, what's exciting for you about Asian cinema then in general right now? Right now, I like the proliferation of independent stuff from Japan um, and not just the traditional sort of artsy stuff. You've got some really cool movies happening. Like, I was on a jury at the Yubari Film Festival in uh, yeah. way up in northern Japan um, last year. And we gave the prize to, you know, you get the, t the typical coming of age stories and whatever. The prize is for independent film, basically a film you know, made by the director. And uh, they, get a, they get a money award to make a new film. Yep. And um, even though it's a, it's a genre, it started as a genre film festival, it really, it really isn't any longer. And the prize, that section of the, the, the new, new cinema prize was usually not a genre film. Well, we gave the prize to a gangster movie. I mean, who makes a gangster movie as their first feature? And this kid, Yusuke Okada, did, and he's, he's just completed another one of uh, his first like big, big feature, uh, Tokyo Playboy Club, with a lot of big actors in it that premieres. Well, premiered in Pusan. It's going to be at the Tokyo Film X Film Festival later this month. And then uh, this year, the jury gave the prize to the Invasion of Alien Bikini, no. which uh, um, is a great independent Korean movie. Um, super low budget, made for like $6,000, but it's amazing. Um, so that kind of stuff is really exciting to me. You know, I like seeing, for the most part, a lot of the the traditional sort of genre masters doing doing stuff over and over again, kind of expanding. Takashi Miike and Shion Sono, you know, are definitely appealing to new audiences now than they had before. And uh, you get a lot of that same on the Korean side. Kind of that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, there's, there's, still, there's still a lot of stuff that you kind of look at and go, okay, nice try, but next... Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you're going to be here for uh, our opening night with Hell Driver. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, what can you tell yes, us about yes. Hell? What can you tell us about Hell Driver? Hell Driver. Hang on, I'm going to put, uh, my plug is out. I need some power. Hell Driver is a uh, atypical zombie movie. I mean, Japan didn't really make hasn't doesn't have a long history of zombie films. Certainly not like the West. And uh, it is. I don't know why. I mean, there's always been a different history of, of monsters and creatures in Japan. Um, the director, Yoshio Nishimura, says also, you know, in Japan, the dead are always traditionally burned. So there was never sort of a, a way of making a zombie movie because cemeteries aren't filled with bodies. So that was a primary challenge that he had when making the film for the first time, when thinking about the film. So and he came up with a unique way of doing it. Uh, it's more sort of through infected people dying and then rising from the dead. Um, but it's wild. I mean, his intention was to exhaust the audience, and it certainly does. It's a long ride. It's a uh, ups and downs like a roller coaster, and it's 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 as much of an action movie as it is a uh, a horror movie. Um, and all on a budget that you know that wouldn't even cover one day's one day of catering on something like the remake of Dawn of the Dead. So it's an exciting movie, but you know people have to realize that it really is. Even though it's made by a studio here, it's basically the budget of an independent film, and it's been made at the studio as an independent film, more or less. You know, um, on the budget of that, and you know the people who make these movies just basically almost kill themselves over doing them. You know, the <laughs> long hours and hardships they have to go through. Yeah, it's really amazing. Fair enough. Well, I, I, you might notice in the background there we've taken the. Uh, um, uh, main graphic from Yakuza Hunters uh, uh, as the uh, mm. emblematic uh, um, uh, emblem <laughs> of Fath. Yeah. I, I just wonder whether you could tell us yes. about Yakuza Sorry. Hunters. Yakuza Hunters is even more of a of an independent film. Um, there, there are actually two films. I forget which one you're showing, but the the um, they're both made by very very independent directors. One by uh, a, uh, a guy's first feature. Um, he had made the, the Yakuza Hunters movies came about from a, a short film that a uh, director made with Asami. They were both fans of old 1970s Toei Yakuza pictures and girl gang movies, and they wanted to make something that kind of was an homage to that rip off, whatever. Uh, and it's really fun. And then it was part of a, um, I think it was a special feature on a box set of short movies of, in a cop, called the Cop Film Festival that a guy named Makoto Shinozaki had started. So, um, director Nakadaira made the Yakuza weapon, or Yakuza, Yakuza Hunter, and um, he and Asami, you know, it was sort of 
praised so much that they wind up getting the money together for the pair of features, which they did, uh, one in the style of 70s Yakuza movies and one in the style of spaghetti westerns. And, um, I mean, Asami is pretty much an icon in and of herself. She's, uh, she's amazing. I wish she were able to make it to Australia this time. Mm-hmm. The audience would love her, but, you know, in, in poster form, she's almost as, almost as good. <laughs> <laughs> the movies are very low, but the movies are very, like, uh, Extremely low budget, but they're really just showcases for Asami, you know, which is which is fine with me. Oh well, we're not getting it star, but we're getting you down here for the uh, opening night. So um, <laughs> thanks for talking to us now, Mark, yes. and um, can't sure. wait to catch up on opening night. Absolutely, yeah. I'm looking forward to being down there. It's my first trip to Australia. Uh, what completely, you know, first trip to Australia in my life. I've always wanted to go and. Um, as much as you guys are celebrating Asian films, I love Australian films. So, you know, it's nice to be going. I don't know if it's nice. I'm a little scared to be going to a place where a movie called, like, uh, Wake and Fright can come out of <laughs> that uh, this sort of thing. Don't but, worry, uh, Mark. We won't take scared you a little bit. back and, le- and leave you there. Or maybe yes. we will. This is more and I are really excited. We love, obviously, we love the Mad Max films, but there's a lot more than that. And actually, in the last two years, there's this whole. You know, resurrection of Australian genre cinema in the U.S. from that uh, from Mark Hartley's documentary. So we're both really looking forward to going. All and right, all the excellent. Fans. We'll see you early. Okay. We'll see you at the, the at the Hell Driver. Thanks, Mark. Yes, looking forward to. It. Thanks a lot. Take care. See ya.